Okay, so the heart conduction. So, um, you know, obviously the heart has to contract, you know, your entire life 24 seven, whether you're awake or asleep. And so it, it has its own, um, its own conduction system, its own way of sending signals for when the cardiac muscle should contract and contract. So, you know, we've got atria ventricle, atria ventricle, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, the cardiac muscle is, you know, it's very interesting um, as a little kind of a, you know, review our similarities and differences between skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, you know, the cardiac muscle, it is striated like skeletal muscle, but it has a unique features, including uh, their specialized tissue to sort of send nerve signals uh, between cardiac cells so that, you know, we don't have to have a nerve uh, going uh, nerve fiber, you know, going to every single heart cell. So that's kind of interesting. But let's look at the overall uh, system of how the nerve signals are sent to tell the cardiac uh, chambers mm -hmm. to contract smoothly. So first, let's go over the terms and we'll look at where these are in the body. And then we'll watch a little snippet of a video. And um, I have kind of uh, improvised a little model that you might find helpful to use with your hands. Um, it's not an exact model. Sorry for the loud sound, that's my cat's automatic cat feeder. Um, okay, so we start off with signal in the SA node and that's located in the right atria which I'm going to uh, use a green to highlight the sinoatrial node. So this is called the SA node and it's nicknamed the heart's pacemaker. So signals from the nervous system, right? The parasympathetic nervous system rest and digest can slow down our heart rate and the sympathetic nervous system uh, fight or flight can uh, speed up our heart rate. So we can have these over overriding signals from our nervous system to speed up or slow down the heart rate. Um, but when it's kind of just operating on its own, it can also keep uh, signals firing all on its own. So we set the pace, our own pacemaker from our SA node up here in the right atrium. And then the signal uh, travels down to the AV node or the atrioventricular node. And this is also in the right atrium, but what it does is it delays the signal um, because we wanna have time between when the atria contract and when those atria contract, they really get the blood down into the ventricles. And then we wanna have time for those ventricles to fill before the ventricles contract and send the blood out. So we wanna have this delayed contraction. So the AV node uh, in purple here, we're going to delay the signal. And then we move on to the AV bundle, which is also called the bundle of Hiss. And this is uh, now gonna start sending the signal down. We're starting to head down into the ventricles. And then we separate then we start to go down into the left and right bundle branches. I'm now in orange. So between the left and right ventricles, you know, we have this thick heart wall. And we have these bundle branches. And then these branch out into all around the ventricles, these Purkinje fibers. And I'm now in pink. So all in the ventricles, we have these Purkinje fibers. And of course, keep in mind that in this diagram, you know, we have like a cross section of a heart, you know, sort of cut. And so we're only seeing this two dimensionally, but try to keep in mind that, you know, these Purkinje fibers, these would be wrapping all the way around the ventricles so they can send a nice uniform signal for the um, ventricles to contract. So again, from the top, we start at the SA node. So here we have the atria 
up here in the right atria, we have SA node or pacemaker that sends a signal to fire. Then the AV node, the signal is delayed. Then we move down to the bundle of Hiss and the left and right bundle branches. And then the Purkinje fibers go around the ventricles and like a tube of toothpaste, they squeeze the blood from the bottom to the top where they send the signal so that we can um, contract the ventricles. So that's the basic pattern. And as far as like your licensing exam or what you need to memorize, you know, the main points here is that the signal gets started to set the pace in the pacemaker in the SA node in the right atrium, gets delayed at the AV node, goes down to the bundle of Hiss, bundle branches for Kinji fibers. So mostly the order um, and that this is um, um, overseeing the uh, flow of the conduction system. So what I'm gonna share in the little snippet of the video, um, how this actually works with um, trigger, triggering the signals is a little more detailed than you're gonna be tested on. But for some of you, um, you might just be interested in, in how it works. Um, so we'll take a moment with that. And sorry, I, I had it, I had it cued, but now I, oh, here we go. transmits electricity along a precisely timed pathway that ends with atrial and ventricular contractions, also known as heartbeats. And it begins with pacemaker cells generating their own action potentials. In most cells, the action potential starts with the resting potential, which the cell maintains by pumping sodium ions out and potassium ions in, right? Then, when some stimulus causes the sodium channels to open up, the sodium ions flood back in, which raises the membrane potential until it reaches its threshold. Pacemaker cells operate the same way, except for that initial stimulus. Stimulus. They don't need it. Their membranes are dotted with leaky sodium and potassium. So again, this is just for your interest. Uh, if you're curious, like how does a pacemaker work, uh, the SA node, I, you're not going to get tested on this level in your MBLEX. Um, the other thing I want to point out, because Hank talks so fast, if you never noticed on a YouTube video in settings, you can change your playback speed. So um, I find uh, he's good at 0.75. Uh, if you're finding he talks too uh, fast for you to follow. ...channels that don't require any external triggers. Instead, as their channels let sodium ions trickle in, they cause the membrane potential to slowly and inevitably drift toward its threshold. Since the leaking happens at a steady rate, the cells fire off action potentials like clockwork, and the leakier the membrane gets, the faster it triggers action potentials. The pacemaker cells at the start of the conduction system have the leakiest membranes, and therefore the fastest inherent rhythms, so they control the rate of the entire heart. And those fast leaky cells are found in the sinoatrial node, or the SA node, up in the right atria. They essentially turn the whole SA node into your natural pacemaker. After those pacemaker cells make themselves fire, they spread their electrical impulses to cardiac muscle cells throughout the atria. The impulses leap across synapse-like connections between the cells called gap junctions and continue down the conduction system until they reach the atrioventricular node, or AV node, located just above the tricuspid valve. Now when the signal hits the AV node, it actually gets delayed for like a tenth of a second so the atria can finish contracting before the ventricles contract. Without that delay, all the chambers would squeeze at once and the blood would just splash around and not go anywhere. So instead, the atria contract and blood drops down into the ventricles, and then a moment later, the signal moves on and triggers the ventricles to squeeze, making the blood flow out of the heart. And there are two tricks to a good ventricular contraction. One, the ventricles are so large that the signal has to be distributed evenly to ensure a coordinated contraction. And two, the ventricles need to squeeze like they're squeezing a tube of toothpaste from the bottom up to 
would accelerate the blood through the big arteries at the top of the heart. So from the AV node, the signal travels straight down to the inferior end of the heart and gets distributed to both sides. The path the electrical impulse takes to the bottom of the heart is called the atrioventricular bundle, also known by the more rad name, the bundle of hiss where it branches out to the left and right ventricles. Finally, the signal disperses out into Purkinje fibers, which trigger depolarization in all surrounding cells, causing the ventricles to contract from the bottom up like toothpaste tubes, at which point the whole cycle starts all over again. And everything I just described to you, from when the SA node fires to when the last of the ventricular cells contract, takes about 220 milli- All right. Um, are there any questions about the basic conduction system? Uh, there are no connection between SA and A, uh, the um, AV nodes. Uh, yeah, there's uh, the connection is just uh, gap junctions or um, between the cardiac cells. Um, there's a conduction system is, is how they're connected uh, versus like uh, its own uh, nerve supply. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, any other questions on that? Okay, so we're gonna watch a very brief segment. Uh, I already have queued to watch the shortest part of this surgery uh, for a pacemaker implant. And so um, in this pacemaker implant, um, and you'll see clients with pacemakers for sure. And uh, usually, you know, they'll put it on their chart. And also you can see it actually uh, sticks out like those little um, round lithium batteries is what the, it will look like, um, you know, sticking out on their chest. And so of course, you know, you wouldn't uh, massage uh, directly there locally. You wouldn't want to put a hot pack right there, um, you know. So uh, somebody asked earlier about, you know, you know, in which situations do you do a pacemaker implant? Um, you know, different things can go wrong with the pacemaker, the SA node. Um, in this surgery, the surgeon talks about how this patient's um, her um, SA node was making it so that the heart was um, beating too slowly. Um, in another situation that's quite common, uh, sometimes the pacemaker is setting a good pace of the heart, and then sometimes it stops. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not doing its job. And so that's another time when the pacemaker will you know, act like a sensor and just, you know, it'll, it'll kick in uh, to override as needed. And um, once these pacemakers are in, you know, of course the surgeons uh, or the, the, the patients get sort of regular checkups on their pacemakers, but they usually work quite well. Um, so if you don't want to watch a short surgery snippet, this is going to be just a few minutes. You can um, review. Uh, yes. Quick question. So does the pacemaker um, just like, is it really seamless as far as how it keeps the heart um, conduction going? Or is it almost like the defibrillators, they, um, he had said that they stop everything and then it all starts again, like the orchestra. Yeah. Um, um there, as far as I have uh, understood them, it's more of a, a seamless kind of uh, running it than the stopping starting of a defibrillator. But that might be interesting for you to research more. Um, okay, so this will take just a few minutes. If you don't want to see it, um, I recommend you uh, take a look at the uh, steps of the conduction system too slowly because of that she doesn't have enough energy she doesn't have enough blood pumping around her body and therefore she gets weak she gets uh, she gets tired easily and i'm um, unable to cope with her daily activity so her her cardiologist referred her for a pacemaker implantation
The device that we are implanting is a Medtronic dual chamber pacemaker, um, which means that there will be one lead, one lead will be placed in the right ventricle and the other lead in the right atrium. The right atrial lead will pick up the signals coming from the coming from this some from this what we call the SA node, which in which the um, signals originate in the normal heart, and the right ventricle lead will will basically deliver that sensation or that that impulse to the ventricle of the heart. So can, between the both of them, that will control the rhythm of the heart. So the patient was prepared for surgery, consented, and um, the procedure itself will be done under local anesthesia. That is, she's given just a little sedation or something to make the procedure a little more comfortable, a drug just to make her a little sleepy, and the actual procedure will be just done with her potentially awake but um, really on the, uh, just on the local anesthesia. Just and then they put in the leads uh, all just with small tubes in the skin. Um, and you can watch the whole thing uh, on your own time if you want to see more. Um, does that bring up any comments or questions? That's crazy that they just use local anesthesia for that. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's, am it's amazing how many surgeries have progressed to the point of, you know, just with the small, you know, the small arthroscopic cameras and just very small incisions, um, how minimally invasive uh, a lot of surgeries have become. But yeah, it's amazing she's on just local. Yeah, um, anything else anyone wants to um, ask or share uh, about that? Okay, so I'm going to uh, share just one more thing here about this uh, heart conduction system. And uh, you might notice kind of on the, the bottom of this diagram, you might recognize that as sort of the signal that uh, is picked up in an EKG. And as massage therapists, you don't need to know how to read an EKG and you don't need to know what each of the little signals stands for, just you might find it interesting uh, that these are actually picking up different parts of this conduction system. Um, they call them the QRS and each, each uh, part uh, picks up a different part. So uh, again, you don't need to memorize this or anything. You just might find it interesting because you'll all have times in your, your own life or loved one's life where you're, you're seeing this. Um, if you were like a medical assistant or a nurse or so forth, of course, you'd have to study uh, this part of it. Um, but so, you know, you could see on the left here where the SA node generates impulse, this little part that's, uh, you know, I like the way it's, you know, kind of colored in this like yellow color or whatever to kind of show you the correlation between what's going on with impulse and uh, the EKG in each step. So of course we go SA node, we're delayed at AV node, uh, then we go to the bundle branches, the bundle of Hiss, uh, bundle of Hiss, and then bundle branches, and then out to the Purkinje fibers. Um, and so then we can uh, coordinate atria contract, ventricles contract, atria contract, ventricles contract, and so forth. Okay, so the blood vessels, um, we've got our arteries that take blood away from the heart and they branch into smaller and smaller. Like if you were gonna go from big rivers and branch into smaller uh, creeks, uh, those would branch into the smaller branches, our arterioles, and then those are gonna branch into the smallest vessels are the capillaries. And we will look at those in more detail then we go to venules, and this diagram here kind of shows that so these small ones are venules after these capillary beds, and then those gather into bigger veins uh, going back to the heart. Um, there's a lot of similarities between the arteries and the veins. Um, they both have three layers, um, and let's uh, take a look at those layers. Um, before we take, uh, well, we'll take a look at the differences at the same time. So um, I'm going to switch over to my document camera because one thing this PowerPoint does not show well are the three layers.
So both the arteries and the veins uh, both have three layers and those layers all have a uh, tunica in the name. So from deep to superficial, we have tunica intima starting deep and then the middle layer is tunica media and then the superficial layer is tunica externa. Um, our internal layer, our intima, the deep layer is an endothelial layer with a single layer of tissue there. The media layer, our middle layer is the layer that has muscle tissue. This is gonna be smooth muscle. So our visceral muscle that's gonna be able to contract to make this opening or lumen smaller, which is vasoconstrict or bigger, which is vasodilate. This is happening with this visceral muscle layer here. And then our uh, external layer is uh, connective tissue layer. So in the arteries and veins, they're named in the same way, intima, media, externa, all with tunic in, tunica in the name. So in this diagram, we can see the arteries here on the left and the veins here on the right. Uh, the layers are the same. What we see different here is that veins have one-way valves. Those valves act in a very similar way to the valves we looked at in the heart. And what they're going to do is prevent backflow of the blood. So in the arteries, we don't need those one-way valves because they're closer to the heart that's really pumping that blood really strong. But by the time the blood gets all the way to the veins, they aren't receiving such a strong pump from the heart anymore. So when the blood moves closer back to the heart on its journey, uh, we don't want it to backflow. So we've got these one-way va va valves. Um, the one-way valves, when they get damaged, uh, this is part of when you can see varicose veins. And in um, Swedish massage, and other circulatory massage, uh, this one-way valve is the whole reason why, um, well, it's the main reason why it's said to move circulatory strokes towards the heart. Uh, there's uh, both wanting to move the blood in that direction, but also not wanting to damage the one-way valves. Is it possible for us to damage the one-way valves? I don't know. Uh, that's the theory. That's why we're cautious about it. We're going to go back to the PowerPoint. Do you have any questions so far? Zephyr, what did you say about the intima again, really quick? It's an endothelial layer. So it's just the inside layer. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, you're not really going to get tested on this, but it's a single layer of um, endothelial tissue. So a single layer of squamous epithelial tissue, but I don't, you won't get tested at that level. Okay. So um, I'd like to, turn our attention uh, to this diagram um, of the blood flow here. I'm circling right now. Uh, let's take a look at this diagrammatic representation before we move on. So again, as we move from the heart through the aorta, which is our biggest artery, from there, we're going to go into some more and more branches, right? Because we have to get this blood to all of the tissues of the whole body. So this is just a diagrammatic representation. You know, in actuality, we're going to have more and more smaller and smaller branches, like branches on a tree. You know, this is like the, if the aorta were a tree trunk, and then we branch off into major branches, and then smaller and smaller branches, if you could picture this on its side, you know, like a tree. When we get to the smaller branches, we're now called arterioles. And then we get to the smallest uh, layer here, which we have here on the bottom, I'm going to circle now in pink, are the capillaries. And we'll talk more about those specifically. At the end of a capillary bed, we have venules. 
So here at the capillaries is where we have this oxygen exchange, right? There's a diffusion of oxygen out into the tissues. And so now it's oxygen poor or deoxygenated blood is now going to continue on. It's heading now back to the heart. In the smallest little creeks, it's called venules now. And those creeks gather more and more of them into bigger tubes, which are veins, until they become the biggest veins. And what are the two big veins coming from the the top of the body and the bottom of the body back into the right atria. What are those big veins called? The vena cava. Fantastic. Yeah. So we go all the way back to the superior and inferior vena cava. Nice job, Mary. Okay. So um, let's talk more about all these different, um, you know, arteries, capillaries, veins, etc. Um, our arteries move blood away from the heart. So all of them have picked up oxygen and are oxygen rich, uh, except for that pulmonary artery, right? Which we already took a look at in the heart. Um, our arteries have very elastic walls. They have uh, their muscular layer, uh, that tunica media muscular layer is a very thick layer of muscle, which allows them to be very stretchy and flexible. Um, why do you think the arteries need very stretchy, flexible um, ability? So they, they can slingshot the blood wherever it needs to go because it can come at a high velocity. So then it has to catch it and then push it back down. Fantastic. Wherever. Fantastic. Yeah. So it's getting that high velocity, lots of pressure from that heart because it's so close to the heart. Um, thanks, uh, Chris. Um, okay. So now let's take a closer look at the capillaries. And, you know, I'm actually going to go back and forth between these two slides. Uh, if we could, before we look at the individual capillaries themselves, if we could first actually take a look at them coming from, you know, the arteries and then these arterioles, um, something interesting is that, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture that we don't actually have the same amount of blood everywhere in the body at the same time the body can actually direct more blood where is needed and sort of prioritize. Um, I mean, obviously it's gonna prioritize things like the brain and the heart. And if you're running the muscles. Um, so how does it actually move more blood some places and less blood other places is that before these capillary beds are these pre-capillary sphincters. And a sphincter is basically a muscles arranged in a circular fashion so that when they contract, they can close a tube. So these pre-capillary sphincters can close off blood supply to a capillary bed or open up to allow blood in that capillary bed. So that's whether we're bringing blood into this capillary bed or not. So, um, Pretty interesting. Now, looking at the capillaries themselves, you know, this is where the oxygen and carbon dioxide, uh, exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide take place. So um, what type of process um, allows oxygen to uh, move across our oxygen and carbon dioxide across a cell membrane? What is that process called? Is that diffusion? Yeah, fantastic. And is that an active, is diffusion an active or a passive process? Active ones, as a reminder, take energy. It requires the use of uh, ATP, whereas passive processes are just driven by pressure gradients or concentration gradients. So is diffusion uh, passive or active? It's passive. passive. Yeah, fantastic. So we're talking about a passive diffusion process. And so we want to have a very thin layer of tissue here. So we have a single layer 
of uh, squamous uh, epithelial cells, those flat cells, so that we can have the passive diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide happen at this layer. Um, so basically, if you remember with diffusion, um, I'm gonna draw a very uh, kind of simple diagram of this as a review. Can I ask a question, Zephyr? Yes. So say if somebody's in fight or flight yeah, and all the energies and the blood and everything's all being used just like, like in very particular, like in the muscles and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm just thinking about the relationship of that and like the sphincters. Yeah. Where so would they the show? sphincters are going to open up around the muscles to let uh, more uh, oxygen in the muscles. We're gonna want oxygen at the heart and the lungs. Um, so we're gonna get a lot of uh, uh, blood in those areas. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about it. Okay, cool. Thank you. So here we have a capillary and it's got a simple uh, layer of squamous epithelial. So it's a very thin layer. We have our little barbell shaped red blood cells and we've got a lot of oxygen. So a high concentration of oxygen inside these little RBCs and a lower concentration of oxygen on the other side. And all the oxygen molecules on both sides are gonna be ping ponging around, but because there's more of them on the inside than the outside, some of them are going to diffuse out. And this is how we get oxygen into the tissues of the body. Now, keeping in mind the way that diffusion works is that we have this random bouncing around of molecules. And so while these little RBCs are traveling through, we have a net diffusion of more oxygen out, but you know, just keep in mind that it's not 100%. So we don't get all the oxygen out at this step. We have some of the oxygen come out and now the um, little red blood cells are gonna continue on their journey. Uh, does this bring up any questions so far? Okay, we're gonna watch a short video. I think this is really cool to see the little RBCs traveling through the capillaries so at this level, uh, at the capillary uh, area, you can see little RBCs traveling single file and in their little capillaries. So here we have some single file RBCs traveling through capillaries. Okay, so um, any questions about the capillaries, their basic structure, or the diffusion of the carbon dioxide and the oxygen? So the O2 is like just coming out randomly in different places, diffusing into the blood? Yeah, so inside, the, uh, inside and outside, it, there's just a different concentration gradient. So it's being driven by a concentration gradient for some of it to, there's gonna be more diffusing from the RBCs out, uh, out of the blood because of the, there's more inside than outside. Uh, so the part of it that's random is that molecules are just, you know, bouncing around, but I guess what's not random about it is that there's a higher concentration. So we're gonna have a concentration gradient drive that diffusion. Does that make sense? It does. I'm just trying to connect it to the bigger picture of like where or how or why or when it's doing it. Yeah, um, great question. So let me go back to this little diagram here and that may or may not be helpful. So, um, you know, 
kind of to go back to sort of the functions of the cardiovascular system, like at the beginning of the chapter, and we're kind of like, we're, we're right here almost at the end, tying everything together. So we need to get this blood with the oxygen, the hormones, you know, all the nutrients, we need to get that to all the tissues of the body. And so these little capillary beds, this is crazy, uh, but these little capillaries are within two cell thicknesses uh, almost everywhere in your whole body. So anywhere that needs to uh, stay alive is going to have this capillary bed within two cells distance of it. So places that don't have a capillary bed right near it are going to uh, die or be hard to repair. So examples would be like the outer layers of the skin where they're going to dry out and flake off because they don't have the capillaries right there. So we're bringing these capillaries, we're bringing the blood in the capillaries close to all the tissues to bring in the oxygen, bring in the hormones, bring in the nutrients and take out the wastes. Is that helpful? It's 2.22. All right. So I'm gonna pause our recording and if you guys wanna take a, a two minute break to meditate, journal, walk, stretch, we'll come back in a few minutes. All right, so we're going to bring this blood uh, now that's gone through the capillaries uh, back through the veins, back to the heart. So a couple things about the veins. Uh, they still have the three tunics or layers. Um, our oxygen poor blood or deoxygenated blood here, uh, except for the pulmonary vein. Uh, this is going to travel back to the heart. Um, We've got these one-way valves to prevent backflow. And uh, we started to talk about this before, but keep in mind that we don't have, by the time the blood has already traveled through the arteries, all the way out to the tissues, say out to the toes or the fingertips or the gastrocnemius or whatnot, and all the way to the little capillary beds, we've had diffusion occur. So by the time it gets to the veins, we don't really have the strong force of the blood uh, or the heart pumping anymore. It's a lot uh, weaker force by that time. So we rely on a couple other mechanisms to get this blood, mostly anti-gravity, right? If you think about we're standing, we're walking, we're massaging, and we gotta get this blood against gravity back up to the heart without a lot of pumping. So that's why, we have these one-way valves. Once the blood gets up, we don't want it to flow back down. And then we also have kind of the uh, contraction of muscles will end up squeezing some of the blood up as well, as well as, you know, anti-gravity positions. So when we're moving around, that all helps get the blood back up. Um, so these, uh, uh, Veins also kind of serve as sort of like a reservoir for the blood. Um, yeah, and they have what's considered a wide lumen. And again, the lumen are the openings. So for our last few minutes of class, um, we're going to uh, play Quizlet Live for this last set. And since we only have four more minutes, um, we'll jump right into practice for the uh, vessels.